Hi, I'm Laura Settis, and I'm investigating the chemical composition of dissolved organic matter in marine sediment pore waters using proton nuclear magnetic resonance spectroscopy. This is a work in progress. Um, I am a grad student working at the in the marine biogeochemistry lab at the Estuary and Ocean Science Center here at SFSU. And I want to start by answering the question, what is DOM? So dissolved organic matter is organic matter that can pass through a filter with pore size between 0.2 and 0.7 microns in diameter. So it's teeny tiny. DOM is comprised of a huge mixture of poorly resolved compounds, which can be quantified in various ways, most commonly by the amount of dissolved organic carbon that it contains. DOM is a major component of the marine carbon cycle. This figure shows the biological pump in which marine phytoplankton perform photosynthesis to make organic matter, remineralization occurs, and particulate organic carbon sinks downward through the water column. And a less famous component of the, of the biological pump is this volume of organic carbon that escapes remineralization and becomes stored as refractory DOC, which is DOC that is remineralized at a very slow rate. Not much is known about this refractory DOC pool, but it most likely plays a significant role in the marine carbon cycle. So now I'll say more about the significance of DOM and why its role in the marine carbon cycle is so important to clarify. Marine DOM is a major carbon reservoir, but little is known about the mechanisms that control it or how it might react to changing environmental conditions. The active marine uh, carbon reservoir contains 0.66 times 10 to the 18th grams of carbon. And that's comparable in size to the pool of atmospheric CO2 and two thirds the size of the pool of land plant biomass. Second, the average age of deep sea DOC is on the order of thousands of years, but that's surprising because more than 99% of freshly produced DOC is remineralized within a decade. But as you can see in this figure, a small fraction of, uh, of DOC undergoes very slow decomposition and accumulates in the ocean over thousands of years. <clears throat> Overall, there's an inverse relationship between DOC age and decomposition rate, meaning that as this DOC ages, it is undergoing decomposition at a very slow rate, which allows it to accumulate into this huge, relatively old pool. So there's this huge old pool of carbon in the ocean. It's only logical to be concerned about how this carbon pool might react to <clears throat> climate change. <laughs> Evidence in the geological record shows a relationship between past warming events and the marine carbon cycle. Because of this, it seems imperative to pin down the role of DOM in the marine carbon cycle as soon as possible. Next, I wanna to talk to you about DOM in ocean sediments specifically. Because sediments are a known source of DOM to the water column. They're a major source of DOC, and we know that this flux is large, but don't really understand the dynamics that control it. Through geochemical modeling, we know that sediment DOM exhibits a wide range of reactivities. <clears throat> and that it is heterogeneous in chemical and isotopic composition. But this composition, this chemical composition is not very well resolved. Therefore, my thesis is focused on resolving the molecular composition of sediment pore water DOM. But molecular characterization is hard. Pore water samples have a high salt content and low DOM concentration. So most analytical methods require samples to be pre-concentrated or filtered or somehow isolated from water, <clears throat> which drastically reduces the amount of DOC that can be um, <clears throat> analyzed in a given sample. However, nuclear magnetic resonance spectroscopy does not require preliminary modification of sample material. Proton NMR spectroscopy is an analytical method which provides information about the chemical environments of protons and the functional groups present in a molecule. When applied to a heterogeneous mixture, proton NMR provides a comprehensive overview of the functional group composition of that mixture. And as geochemists, NMR is one of the strongest tools we have to characterize the molecular composition of marine DOM. So now before I present my own results, I wanna contextualize them by discussing data from some previous research. In 2018, Fox et al. applied proton NMR to anoxic sediments in Santa Barbara Basin and found that marine sediments were a major source of DOM that's compositionally unique from DOM generated in the upper ocean. 
They were specifically interested in carboxyl-rich alicyclic molecules, or CRAM. And protons, which indicate CRAM, present as well-resolved peaks uh, on top of this broader envelope. And uh, CRAM is thought to represent an especially refractory component of marine DOM. And it dominated the proton NMR signal in these anoxic sediments. And its strong presence uh, increased with depth. But how might CRAM's presence be affected in a different benthic environment? like one dominated by mixed redox conditions, for example. The only way to find out is to generate the first comprehensive set of NMR spectra on whole marine pore water DOM from a mixed redox environment. So now my current research asks the question, how does the chemical composition of pore water DOM change with depth in a mixed redox environment? And I'm endeavoring to uh, answer these quest this question using the following objectives. First, I'll identify trends in chemical composition of pore water DOM across a redox gradient. And my hypothesis is that CRAM will increase with depth, um, but at lower concentrations than in anoxic sediments. And um, then uh, I will attempt to evaluate changes in reactivity of pore water DOM with depth with the hypothesis that reactivity will decrease with depth. And my approach to accomplishing these objectives is to conduct this research at two sites characterized by mixed redox conditions and bioturbating macrofauna, and to use proton NMR spectroscopy and 2D correlation analysis to explore significant changes with depth. <clears throat> so our samples were collected from two sites uh, in the California borderlands this fall at stations D and K. Abor um, those sites are, or those stations rather, are offshore from Big Sur. Um, and we, we collected the samples aboard the RV Seculiac. Both sites have relatively high pore water DOC concentrations, making them appropriate study sites for analysis of pore water DOC. And samples were collected using a multi core. There's me checking out the multi cores. Um, and multi-cores sample the top 30 to 40 centimeters of sediment. And um, we also used a big Bertha core, which samples the top three meters of the sediment column, which you can see here on the right. So back at lab, I've been preparing whole pore water samples for analysis um, by, the by the chemistry department's Bruker Advanced Spectrometer. Analysis is being performed using Lamb and Simpson's W5 Watergate solvent suppression method. And so far, I processed about 14 pore water samples and have been finding that the chemical composition of the samples is more or less similar within individual cores. Um, here are proton NMR spectra from multi-core samples at station K. Each subsequent spectra that I'm showing you is from a sample moving deeper into the sediment. And now here are spectra from multi-core samples <clears throat> taken from station, um, from station D, again, moving deeper into the sediment as we go here. And then finally, um, here's spectra from a big Bertha core at station D, which goes down about three meters into the ocean floor. So then I generated the average spectrum for each of these three cores and highlighted the appearance of the cram envelope. And um, you might be able to notice, uh, just kind of by eyeballing these spectra, that more cram appears down here in the deeper big Bertha core than we see in the, the shallower multi-core cores. And um, then I compared these average spectra from the average spectrum from Fox et al's research. And we can see that my samples from the mixed redox sites appear to contain relatively less cram than Fox et al's samples taken from anoxic sediments, which is pretty sweet because that lines up really neatly with my first hypothesis. So I will continue processing samples from these two sites to see if the trend holds up and then move on to investigating my second hypothesis. I couldn't have done any of this work without the help of the Estuary and Ocean Science Center, the NSF, and this list of amazing people. And um, now I'm happy to answer any questions that you have.